Uh, welcome to the Teaching with Tinkercad webinar number three, which is called Tinkercad Tips and Tricks. Uh, this is part of our webinar series for the first part of the year where we're going to be meeting to talk about uh, Tinkercad things. And I want to give you a friendly reminder that if you missed the first two webinars, you can find them on our YouTube channel. So that's going to be shared out in the follow-up email, uh, and maybe we'll work to get that in the chat so you can see that. So you can always revisit these webinars and check them out after the fact. Even this one, even though you're here, you might want to revisit some of the great things that we're going to talk about. So these are recorded, so you can check them out after the webinar happens. Now, my name is Jason Erdreich, and I'm an engineering and design educator, and I'm working with the Autodesk and Tinkercad team to do things like this for this webinar, just to kind of collaborate and support our teachers like you as we learn how to teach with Tinkercad and Fusion 360 and the Autodesk apps. And I'm joined by my co-host, Randy Sarafan, who's going to say hello. Hello, uh, I'm Randy. I'm on the Tinkercad team, and I also help out with Instructables, and I'm here today to help out in the chat and answer any questions you might have and just generally make sure things are moving along. Yeah, and I also just want to give a shout out. We have a number of Tinkercad teams who are always with Randy and I on these webinars who are working behind the scenes. So tonight I have Nicole and Christian with me, and I'm not sure if you can see their faces, but you'll definitely have a chance to see them face to face uh, later tonight when we go into our Q&A. But throughout the webinar, as you're asking questions and putting things in the chat, that the whole Tinkercad team here is with me and they're going to be working to answer your questions and support you. So just a huge thank you to everyone who's helped put this webinar together and who's helping make this night really exciting. So I also want to wish everyone a happy Tinktober. We are on the 19th day of Tinktober. So this is a fun little activity that we have going on throughout the month of October where we're giving you 31 different design starters or ideas that you could be doing with your students. So uh, if you're looking for a quick mini challenge throughout the month and you want to theme it to some great things going on, perhaps you can challenge your students to make a carnivorous plant, which was today's theme, or maybe a scarecrow, which is what we're talking about tomorrow. And you can also check out the Tinkercad blog where we are sharing uh, a number of these projects and things. So make sure you share that with us uh, if you want to let us feature some of your awesome designs. And I can see that somebody just dropped in uh, the Tinkercad past webinars and also this link to the Tinktober challenge in the chat. So you can definitely check that out as we go. Now, uh, the Teaching with Tinkercad webinar series, as I mentioned, this is our third one. It's going to be held on Thursdays at this time, so 7 p.m. EDT or 4 p.m. PDT, uh, but that's going to vary a little bit, so we're always going to work around holidays and things like that, and we're also working with some feedback that we've gotten from our attendees from the past webinars, so we're looking at maybe some schedule changes in the future, so just stay tuned to the Tinkercad blog and also the webinar page, uh, which you use to register for this webinar for any schedule changes, because we're always going to post the next couple webinars so you can see what's coming up and things to look out for. The next webinar will be on November 2nd, and it's going to be called Teach Physics with SimLab, uh, which of course is a really great simulation feature in Tinkercad. So stay tuned for that one. And again, you can check out more details about the webinar on the blog. Now, we're going to ask you to introduce yourself. So Randy's going to drop a poll, and if you can share your experience with Tinkercad, we'd love to just know where you're coming from here. All right, so I see experience levels all over the place. So just take a second, let us know, are you just getting started? Yeah, it seems like everyone has, well, the majority of people have a little bit of experience, but not a ton. And there seems to be no experts tonight, but maybe after tonight, there'll be a couple of experts. Uh, we'll we'll see how that goes. Um, oh, we seem to yeah. lost. Yeah, no, sorry. I, my dog is as excited about this webinar as I am. So I had to uh, just let my, I had to see what my dog experience level was there for a minute there, but that's super exciting. Yeah, so that's really great. So we have a really nice variety of uh, users here from all over the experience level, which is super exciting. So thank you for that. And I'm definitely gonna you know keep that in mind as we, we chat about the different tips and tricks through tonight's webinar. So I see a lot of folks are you know trying to raise hands and, and asking questions. So let's talk about the best way to participate. I'm going to be covering a lot of content uh, quite quickly because obviously we don't have a ton of time together tonight. So the best way to participate during the webinar is using the Q&A feature. So on your toolbar, there's a Q&A where you can drop in a question. And that's really great because the question will stay there until the Tinkercad team has a chance to answer it. And then everyone can kind of go back and see the questions that are answered, which is great. You can, of course, continue to put things in the chat, but as you'll see, the chat moves kind of quickly. So we're going to be working to keep up with that, but it, we might lose something. It might get lost as we have all of our conversations. So again, please take advantage of that Q&A feature. Drop your questions into the Q&A, and throughout this entire webinar, the Tinkercad team is going to be working to drop links and resources and answering those questions as we go. And at the end of the webinar,
webinar, we're going to have a dedicated Q&A portion where you'll be able to see all the Tinkercad team members that are with me face to face and uh, ask your questions as we kind of review all the things that we've talked about. And again, I want to also remind you that this is being recorded so you can revisit this. And uh, we're going to share this slideshow that you see as well with all of our attendees. So you'll have access to these slides after the fact as well. So before we dive in, I see that we have some new users. So I'm going to do a quick, what is Tinkercad? And if you've joined us before, you've seen this before, which is great. But in case you don't know, Tinkercad is actually broken down into primarily three different like mini applications in our Tinkercad app. And 3D design is the one that we're going to be focusing on the most tonight as we talk about our 3D design tips and tricks. But that allows you to really make anything by combining shapes to manipulate their parameters and group them together and make really interesting objects, which you can turn into 3D work worlds, you can download to 3D print, you can turn into physics simulations, as we'll talk about in our next webinar, really just about anything. And we're going to dive deep into this one tonight as we talk about tips and tricks. But there's also the circuits feature, which allows you to simulate electronic circuits in your web browser. So you can grab a battery and hook it up to different wires and switches or even microcontrollers like a micro bit and program uh, a circuit that would actually interact like it would if you built it on your bench top right in front of you. And there's also code blocks, which is a different way to design in 3D. Students who are familiar with this, uh, a block-based programming language might recognize something like this, or it might feel kind of natural to them if they've done something like this before. But what's really unique about code blocks is that instead of you know maybe making an app or a game, you're actually making three-dimensional models by creating patterns and inputting code to make really interesting 3D parameters. And you can actually export your code block 3D models into the 3D editor to enhance and work with them and change your models or even download your 3D design things to be 3D printed. So you can basically 3D print with code, which is really cool. So three different apps that are kind of built into the Tinkercad uh, application. And as I mentioned, we're gonna be focusing primarily on the 3D design editor as we go through our tips and tricks. And the first tip and trick I wanna talk about is keyboard shortcuts. So the keyboard shortcuts, which you can download this, uh, I've linked it here in the slideshow and maybe we can also try to drop this in the blog. So you can download this in poster format if you wanna print this out and put this in your room. Uh, just allow you to kind of work through Tinkercad a little bit more quickly, right? So if you want to select a tool, you can hit a keyboard shortcut and that would select it more uh, quickly for you. But also some things allow you to change your design. So for example, holding shift allows you to keep things proportional and I'll be demonstrating all that in a little bit. So I love talking about the keyboard shortcuts or the mouse shortcuts. Um, we also love recommending folks work with an actual USB mouse with a scroll wheel so you can easily left click and right click and click the wheel in. That usually allows you to get some different shortcuts and enhance your design features. So that's my first tip and trick is try to learn these shortcuts. Use a mouse that gives you more control over your design and tonight, as I'm using tools, I'm going to work really hard to mention what the keyboard shortcut would be for those tools as I'm demonstrating that live. Uh, the next set of uh, tips and tricks here, I'm actually going to demonstrate live. So I'm going to switch to a Tinkercad screen here. But what I just want to let you know is everything I show you live in Tinkercad is going to be included in this slideshow. So if you want to revisit or if you want to you know, read about the different tips and tricks I'm gonna go over, you can see that every single thing is gonna have a slide and that's something that you'll be able to reference after tonight's webinar. So let me switch to my Tinkercad screen. All right, so you can see I'm signed into my uh, 3D editor here, okay? And as I mentioned, the first thing I'm just gonna talk about um, is using a mouse, right? So if I left click, I can select objects, right? So I can drag my shapes. If I right click and drag, this allows me to orbit around, which is the same thing as clicking on this view cube. If I scroll my wheel, I can zoom in, which is the same thing as pushing the zoom here or here, but I can scroll my mouse wheel to zoom in wherever my mouse pointer is. And if I click my mouse wheel in, I can pan, so I can pan side to side. So that's a really great thing. Uh, and using shortcuts and an actual USB mouse kind of allows you to work with that a little bit more effectively as we go. Now, the next tip and trick that I want to show you about is our shape parameters. So whenever I drag out one of the basic shapes, we have our window here where we can change uh, you know, the color of it and things like that or change it to be a whole. But I also have these sliders which can adjust it. So for example, you'll notice if I look at my cylinder, I can adjust how many sides it has, which would make my cylinders smoother or more chunky. So I can adjust my shape here by changing the sides. I could add a bevel on this, 
And sometimes if you grab a shape, you might not see these. And it's because this little arrow can hide or show these parameters. And it's going to vary a little bit from shape to shape. So for example, you can see these parameters. I have sides, I have bevel, I have segments for my cylinder. But if I were to grab a rectangle, we can see that the parameters are slightly different. So I have radius, which will kind of curve and round the edges of my rectangle, which is a little bit different than the bevel. And I can also adjust the size here. So I can actually use this slider to adjust the length and the width and the height. And this is whatever unit I'm working in. So my, my window right now is set to be millimeters. So I can see that this is showing me in millimeters. So for example, we can see that my length is 31.1. And if I click on this, I can see here is that same measurement. And of course, I can you know, drag my shapes out here. I can click on these measurements and type them in manually. But you can also use the sliders to adjust that as well. And I want to go back to my shortcuts for a second. Uh, for example, if I grab these corners to change the size of my shapes, we can see that I can change in whatever direction I'm grabbing the corner and manipulating the shapes for. But if I hold shift when I drag, it now keeps proportion. So that's a good keyboard shortcut to know that right now what I'm doing is I'm holding shift while I'm dragging. We can see that my shape is staying proportional as we go. So that's a really awesome uh, keyboard shortcut that makes designing really, really great as we're working with our basic shapes. And again, these parameters are going to change depending on whatever shape you're working at. So you, you'll see all different types of parameters depending on these basic shapes that you have here. So they're not universal. They're kind of unique to whatever the shape can do. Now, another lovely thing that I like to talk about is our rotation. So I'm going to grab this star, as we can see here. And I can rotate it by using, obviously, these little black cone arrows, which lets me rotate it. And I can do that in any one of my three dimensions. So I can rotate that across any one of my axes here. But when I look at this rotation ring, if I'm inside the ring where my mouse is, I'm rotating by 22.5 degrees segments, like so. If I hold shift, I actually rotate by 45 degree segments. And if I let go of shift and move my mouse outside of the ring, I rotate by one degree segments. So the rotation tool really allows you to determine how fine detail you want your movement to be based on whether your mouse is outside of the ring like this, inside the ring, or holding shift would lock you to different orientation. And I also want to uh, let you know that not only is this in the slideshow, our Tinkercad team is doing a great job at dropping videos and guides in for everything I'm talking about too into the chat. So you can check that out. And this is actually a new update as well. So the rotation ring has always kind of worked like this, but the, the UI and the design has been improved to give you some more control as you're designing. So if you've used the rotation tool a while ago, you might notice it's just a little different now. So shout out to the Tinkercad team for always making things better as they were. So I'm going to drag this up. I'm going to lift this off my work plane here. And I'm going to hold uh, the Option key on a Mac or the Alt key on a Windows or a Chromebook. And that allows me to copy while I drag. So that's another awesome keyboard shortcut. So I can very easily uh, copy and paste. And I'm doing this lovely little star thing here to show you the next tip and trick. And that is talking about your work plane settings. So if I come down here and if I hit settings, we can, of course, change our unit that we want to work in. I can change the size of my work plane. And you can also make these default. So let's say, for example, you always want to start with a work plane that's 100 by 100 millimeters. You can type that in and hit default. And now every Tinkercad document you do, you'll start with that uh, default setting. You can also adjust your zoom speed. But what I love doing is changing the background. So I can change the background of my Tinkercad window. Uh, which will make it look like this. I can turn off the shadows if I want. So you'll notice that there's no more shadows below my stars. And I can even hide the grid. So that really allows you to take your Tinkercad and turn it into this nice 3D world where you can manipulate your background, you can manipulate your work plane, you can challenge your students to create these really beautiful 3D scapes in their designs, all by tuning your workplace settings. I'm just going to go back to our uh, default here um, as I go back to, let's say, show, show, show grid. There we go. Looking a little bit more familiar. And another great thing down here is this snap grid feature. So when you click on a shape, when I use my arrow keys, you'll notice that I can move it using the arrow keys on my keyboard. Also, when I drag, 
it kind of, uh, you know, drags to certain locking positions as you do certain things, kind of like the rotation tool. So it depends on what tool you're doing, but you'll see that when I move this with my arrow keys, uh, it moves so much. If I change my grid, so say, for example, I go to five millimeters, every arrow key you'll see is a little bit bigger, every arrow key tab. And that's because this determines the increments that you can move or that you drag things in based on it. So you can see that I'm kind of moving in sort of this chunky pattern as I drag this across my grid. And if I adjust this to say 0.1 millimeters, you'll see that it's much smoother. And when I press my arrow keys, it moves at a very, very slow rate. So this gives you a little bit more precision uh, as you're trying to move things, or even let's say that you want an object to be exactly a certain distance from something else. And we'll talk about the ruler tool in just a minute, but you can set your grid to be something. And this is a great way for students to adjust uh, you know, the position things either very fine or to adjust the position things at a more coarse level, which might be easier for younger students to kind of align and move their shapes around. So that's a great drop down that you can use as you manipulate and work around the work plane. Um, you can also use the mirror tool up here if you'd like to flip and mirror shapes. So if I wanted to say flip my starscape, I could click on this. That's the mirror tool, these two triangles here, or M on your keyboard. And you'll see that I have three different arrows for my three different dimensions. So I can mirror across any of my axes uh, and that'll allow you to flip your shapes, which is really fun if you're working for a symmetrical project. Like if you're making a car uh, and you wanna make a symmetrical car, or let's say for example, you're designing something uh, for 3D printing uh, and you want your text to be backwards because it's going to be, let's say a stamp that you wanna 3D print. Well, this is just a super easy way for you to mirror your text as you're working with your design. Uh, and that allows you to move uh, your shapes around really, really simply as you go here. So I love the mirror tool for a lot of different things, symmetrical design, and as we create really unique things in our Tinkercad shape. So another great tip and trick. Now, one of my favorite tools uh, is the align tool. And I have to be honest, I learned something new when I was preparing for this webinar, even though I, I would consider myself a relatively advanced Tinkercad user, but there's, oh, you can always learn new things. So I'm gonna grab two shapes. And what I wanna do is I wanna create a cup. So I wanna take this second shape and put this inner whole cylinder just inside this one. And I want it to be perfectly centered, right? And that can be kind of difficult to align this, uh, you know, and look at your shapes, right? So it can be a little challenging to do, but what we can do is use the align tool. So if I select both of my shapes, this align tool lights up, which the keyboard shortcut would be L. And we can see that I can align across my three dimensions. So I can center in this dimension, center in this dimension. And if I wanted to, I can center in my vertical dimension as well, which in this case, I don't want to. But if you noticed, what just happened was my shapes kind of met in the middle when I did that, right? So I can click on this, hit align and center my shapes, but they all moved and they met in between the shapes to center them perfectly. When you're using the align tool, you can set a reference shape, meaning if I don't want this orange cylinder to move, I'll select both my shapes, I'll hit align, and I'm gonna click on this orange cylinder first. Now I'm aligning to the position of my orange cylinder. So the other shape moved, but my orange cylinder stayed in position. And I have to be honest, I learned that today. And I'm super excited about it because it's a really great tool for you to be able to align your shapes without adjusting your position very, very fun. Uh, and just goes to show you that even if you've learned and you've been using Tinkercad for a while, you learn new things all the time. So that's a good one. Uh, while we're at it, let's talk about editing within groups, right? So we know that I have two group shapes here. I can click ungroup and we'll see that I have my cutting cylinder, my whole cylinder. We can see that we have my outer solid cylinder, right? And I can ungroup things to manipulate them. But I can also just double click on a group and I can edit within. You can see that there's this red box or this red shadow around my shapes, right? So that means that I'm within my group. And if I wanted to say, adjust this inner cylinder, I could. And then when I click away, it goes back to being group. So it's a really easy way for you to manipulate your groups without having to ungroup things. And I know I only have two shapes here, right? But if I had a lot of shapes, so if I actually turn this into being, let's say a coffee mug real quick, and I'll just pull this in like so, and 
ungroup everything, right? So I'm just going to make a nice quick coffee mug here. And I want to manipulate the size of my handle without having to ungroup. I can double click and select any of my shapes that I have in this group and then click away and I go back to having a group. So another really cool shortcut for when you're working in groups, which of course you are when you're manipulating your shapes and things, just double click and you can edit the individual shapes within a group, which is super fun. Uh, so for this next one, let me grab a shape with some angles here. Okay, so I'm gonna grab this shape, a nice polygon as we're working. We can also see that I can, uh, with my, um, sliders adjust how many sides my polygon has. So that's a fun thing that we just talked about, right? Um, and let's say that I want to put something right on a single angle, like one of these sides, right? So let's say that I want this cylinder to be perfectly angled on this polygon, right? And there's a couple ways you could do this. One tool is the work plane tool. So if I drag a work plane onto any of this sides of my polygon, we can see that a new work plane was drawn. When I drag a shape out, it's going to be on that plane. So we can see that it just aligns with my shape, which is super cool. What's even cooler is if I use the align tool while I'm on this work plane, I can actually center it on this face of the shape. So I'm actually centering it on this side of my polygon, which is super fun. So that makes you know adding shapes onto really unique angles super easy to do. And that's just one way to do it. Um, of course, you can you know, manipulate and drag your shapes. There's also a new feature to Tinkercad, or at least it came out a couple of months ago, called Cruise, which kind of allows you to make a plane on just a single face at a time. So if I click on this little uh, magnet icon or press C on my keyboard, I can select a side of my shape and drag it to, again, snap it to another shape. So that's another great way for you to be working on angles, uh, either using the work plane tool to create a work plane uh, on the surface of a shape, or use the cruise tool to very quickly snap shapes together. And I think this is a game changer for our youngest students that are trying to make multiple shapes here. So let's say, for example, I want to put a cylinder onto another cylinder. It's, I think, one of the hardest types of designs or combinations you can do if you're making a robot arm. But if I use cruise, I can very easily snap this along the sides of my cylinder here and combine my shapes together very simply. Uh, or again, I can actually create a whole work plane, which is super fun and super useful if you wanna align your shapes to uh, things. That's a really powerful tool for when you're combining your shapes together. Um, let's see, another great one, uh, especially if you're trying to make more advanced designs. And I'll be honest, I have no idea what the shape is. So we're gonna start fresh, uh, is using the ruler tool. So let's say, for example, I am making a part uh, that has to be very specific. So I want it to be exactly 80 millimeters by 80 millimeters by, let's say, 10 millimeters. And this is going to be a plate that something else attaches to. So I know that I need holes in a very specific location, right? So I'm going to make my holes uh, 10 millimeters in size as we go here, like so, okay? And I know that I need two holes that are a very set distance from the edge. So how do I do that? Well, one, I like to look at my shapes from the top view. And not only that, I like to turn on orthogonal view. So if I click on this little button down here, it will switch to an orthographic view and it flattens our shapes. It kind of removes the 3D aspect of it, right? So that'll allow us to have this flat perspective, which makes viewing things a little bit easier. And if you're in 3D in orthographic, you kind of have this weird angle going on, right? So you want to kind of toggle back and forth between perspective view if you're looking in 3D or orthographic view if you're looking at a flat plane like this. And I'm going to drag my ruler out and drop it onto the work plane. What I can do is drag the origin point of my ruler to be right on the corner of my shape. And when I click on, say, my hole here, not only does it tell me the size of the hole, it will also give me the distance from my origin, which, of course, is this, the side of my shape. So if I would need this hole to be exactly, let's say, 10 millimeters from the edge on either side, that allows me to set the distance from the edge really well. And you'll also notice that it's setting the distance from the edge of my hole. If I click this little menu button here, I can switch to using the midpoint. So you'll see that I just went from being 10 millimeters away to 15 millimeters away, millimeters away, even though the cylinder didn't move. And that's because right now it's measuring from the center of my cylinder 
or I can switch to measure from the endpoint of my cylinder. You can kind of go back and forth. And this works for any of the shapes. So if I click on this one, I can set this shape to be however far away I want it to be. Um, oops, it's one too far. And, you know, put precise measurements between our objects. And you can, of course, move your ruler. So let's say that you want to work off of a different origin point. So if I'm moving to, uh, you know, a different part of my shape, and perhaps I need the origin point to be somewhere else, I can easily position my ruler wherever I need it to be to grab you know, the measurements that I'm working with, or even of course, dismiss the ruler when you're done using that tool. So a really great tool for working with precise measurements. And I know earlier I mentioned the snap grid. So that's another way that you can kind of space objects out. You can you know, set this to be a certain distance and use that to accurately space things apart or drop the ruler there and set your dimensions between your shapes as you're working. Um, so I think one of my favorite design features is the duplicate tool. Um, the duplicate tool allows you to not only copy objects, right? So for example, if I press duplicate, I just got a second object. So that's really great. But it also duplicates whatever transformations you do. So for example, if I click on a shape and I hit duplicate and I move it a certain distance and perhaps I change its size, if I remain selected and press duplicate again, which is also control D, it will not only copy the shape, it copies the transformations. So it copied how far I moved it and how much I changed its size, which allows you to make really cool patterns in your design. So I mentioned that we have Tinktober here. So let me see if I can do a very Octobery theme. Bear with me for a second. I'm going to grab a sphere and let's set that to be a very fall color. I'm going to duplicate the sphere. I'm going to move it just a little bit. And I'm also going to change its angle a bit. We'll see if this works live. If I duplicate a bunch of times, I can create my pattern. And in this case, a pumpkin. So I can manipulate my shapes and of course, then group that together. So duplicate tool, super fun for not only making copies of shapes, but making really, really aesthetically pleasing patterns in your design, right? Um, and we'll stick with this as I'm working with my pumpkin here. Let's stick with our Tinktober theme and see if we can combine some things together. So if I wanna make a, a nice eye for my jack-o'-lantern, maybe I put a work plane on one of my bevels and uh, I'm going to drag the pyramid out onto this work plane, right? So we can see how I can kind of combine my skills and my tools together here, changing my view. And of course, as I'm demoing this live, I'm uh, making a mess of my, my eye here. So bear with me, but I'll figure it out eventually. Eventually it'll look a bit like a pumpkin. Who doesn't love experimentation here as you're designing your Tinkercad shapes, right? So super fun, just change that color and move that in. Now, while I'm working with the shape, um, something else that I love to do as I'm working with a complex design is locking shapes that I don't want to manipulate, right? So I have this eye, and I'm going to want to select it, uh, but I don't want to change this pumpkin. I want to leave this pumpkin how it is. So if I click on this, I can hit this little lock icon here, and now I can no longer move this pumpkin. It's It can't be dragged. I can't change the scale. We can see that it's just highlighted in purple, so that way the only shape I can manipulate is my eye which means that when I drag it over here and use the mirror tool we talked about easy, earlier, I won't accidentally adjust my pumpkin as I'm working with my jack-o'-lantern. So the lock tool is another really great uh, feature so that way you don't uh, accidentally manipulate your shapes. And I think I'm gonna try to use the duplicate tool one more time here. So if I bring this tooth out, let's see, I'm going to duplicate, move, and rotate a bit. And we'll see if I can successfully add some teeth to my pumpkin. It's not the best, I'm sure you could do better, but I think it works, I think it works. I'm going to unlock this so I can group all these shapes together and attach everything. And you'll notice that everything's gonna to change to be the same color once this loads. Uh, so if I click on solid here, we can see everything automatically switched to orange. But if I hit multicolor, it allows me to uh, adjust and have still a group shape. These are still grouped, 
but I can use whatever the shape colors were before the grouping. So I will, it will retain the fact that I had uh, black for the eyes uh, and you'll retain the fact that I had orange for the pumpkin there. So that's really great. Something else you might wanna do is you might wanna hide a shape temporarily, right? So let's say for example, I wanna design something else for my pumpkin. We can see that this is taking up a lot of space. Uh, so I just want this to kind of disappear for a brief moment. So if I hit this little light bulb in my shape, it will actually hide it. It's not gone. I'll show you how to get it back in a second. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is, let's see if I can use my favorite thing in the world, which is my duplicate tool, one more time to make a stem for my pumpkin. Let's see if this works. Like so. I think that'll do. Manipulate the size a little bit group it, change the color. We can also go to custom colors. I love playing with this. So you can not only use the presets that you have here, but you can really dive in and create your own custom shapes or even drop in uh, specific RGB values or HSB values or a hexadecimal here. So really cool ways for you to customize your colors, especially if you're teaching uh, graphic design and things, or if you wanna have a specific product color. But anyway, here we go. I have my stem. I wanna bring my jack-o'-lantern back. You'll notice that this little light bulb lit up on my top toolbar. And the only reason that's lit up is because I have hidden shapes. So if I click on my light bulb, the jack-o'-lantern comes back. And we can see that the light bulb is, not, is now grayed out because there are no hidden shapes. So I'll show you that again. If I click on my jack-o'-lantern, I hit the light bulb up here and it disappears. I can now click on the light bulb on my toolbar and that will show my hidden shape. So again, it allows you to kind of clear your work plane as you are manipulating your shapes. I think I might have lost it a little bit on this stem, but it works. It works. A jack-o'-lantern for Tinktober, not too bad. So let me just group all that together. I also don't know if you know this. You'll see that my shape's red right now. That means that Tinkercad's loading. So if you ever see something like this, uh, if your shape is red, that means that it's it's grouping and it's loading. So be patient. And if you have complex shapes like this where you have uh, a bunch of things uh, going on, uh, then, then it might take a second for you to actually group. Um, so I want to show you something else about color, but for this, I'm going to switch to a uh, different design. Okay, so we're now looking at a fish tank. All right. And in color, I want to talk about transparency, right? So I've seen my students want to create something like this where they have glass. Uh, and what they often do is initially they'll set it to be a hole because we know that holes are clear. But we also know that whole shapes are designed to cut holes in things, right? So it's not necessarily uh, a clear shape. It's really it's a cutting shape. So I want this to be solid. I want this to be solid glass. So in my menu here, I can adjust the transparency of my shapes. So if I pick light blue and click transparent, we can now see that I just made the shape be clear, like glass, right? So that's not a hole, it's still a solid, uh, but it allows us to uh, kind of add to our shapes. Um, and you know, if I wanted to, for example, uh, put some hypothetical water in my tank, I might grab another shape and fill it up a little bit. And maybe we'll make this deep blue and set this also to be transparent. And we can see that I kind of have my glass and I have my water, right? So it allows us to really enhance our designs and the aesthetics of our designs uh, as you're working with shapes. So again, transparency is different than a hole because it's still a solid. It's just a transparent color. And something else that's super cool, while I have two designs that are open, I don't know if a lot of you know about this, but it's one of my favorite things. I have my fish tank in this design, of course. I have my jack-o'-lantern in this design, and I'm switching between tabs. Uh, you can copy and paste Tinkercad from one to the other. So if I click on my jack-o'-lantern here, and if I want my jack-o'-lantern to be in my fish tank, I can copy it. So I'm going to press Control C, or I can use the toolbar up here to copy my shape, not duplicate, but copy. And I'm gonna switch back to my fish tank and paste. And it just pulled one Tinkercad design in from another. So we can put my four jack-o'-lantern in my fish tank here. So I can combine my different designs. So that's a fun one. As you're working with your shapes, you can kind of combine your designs together, which is awesome. Something else you can do is as you design a custom shape like this jack-o'-lantern, you could be really proud of it, right? So I love this thing. And I might wanna use it in a future design. I can actually turn this into a shape, uh, just like these shapes, just like our basic shapes or just like the different shape menus. So you'll notice that you have a lot of different menus with, of course, a lot of different shapes. And one of them is called Your Creations. 
These are shapes that you can actually create by combining things. So I can go to your creations and I can click create shape. And this one might take a second to load because it's a pretty complicated one with all my duplicates. Uh, but I can call this Jack Bo Lantern or whatever it is I want to name it. I can tag it so I can find it more easily. If I wanted to, I can lock its size, which means that you won't be able to change the scale. So let's say that you're a teacher and you want your students to design uh, for something. You want to make a template of something in your room, like, I don't know, a, a mouse trap or, or something that they're using in a STEM project. You can actually make a shape, lock the shape, and then share it out, uh, which is super cool. But I'll leave it unlocked for now. I'm going to hit save. And it might take a second to load because, again, it's kind of complex. Uh, and while it loads, I want to show you another cool thing, and that's favoriting shapes. So there's so many different menus here, of course. And you can find yourself scrolling for a long time to find a shape. Uh, or you can, of course, switch between categories as you are browsing between your shapes. But, you know, maybe there's one you use a lot, right? Like I might use this mustache a lot, right? And I don't want to have to scroll through. You notice that every shape has a little star and I can star and favorite any shape I want from any one of the categories here uh, if I want to be able to find it uh, more frequently. So I'll just star one more. So maybe I like to use this uh, Pokeball, right? And I have favorites. So even search by your shapes, uh, which might make finding things really, really cool. We'll see that my creation is done. So if I, now that I've made this pumpkin shape, I can delete it and I can drag it out. And that's attached to my account, which means uh, if I sign into a future Tinkercad document, uh, we can you know, grab this jack-o'-lantern, which means that you can actually uh, work between uh, you're saving your shapes and manipulating them and finding them in your own shape menu, which is super cool. So you can not only favorite shapes uh, that already exist, you can create your own custom shapes and reference them in the future. I want to show you one of my favorite shapes. Uh, and it's a gradient. And this is, again, something that I learned earlier today uh, or while I was planning for this webinar. I was like, wait, what? There's no way. How do they do that? Right. So super, super cool. Um, let me just change the size of my window here so I can find it. Let me see. I might have to search design starters. Where is my gradient? Let's see. I think it's all the way over here. There's a couple of them. Here we go. Really cool pattern. And this gradient block can be used to color your shapes in a gradient, kind of by making a mold, which is a fun project for your students to kind of talk about. So here's what I mean. I'm going to go back and I'm going to make my coffee mug again, and I'm just going to do it really quick. So I'm not worried about my dimensions here as I'm working with my mug. And where's my handle we need, right? So let me just make my mug here. Bear with me. One of my favorite projects to make. Super simple, here we go. All right, so I have my mug all grouped together and I want this mug to be gradient color, right? So how do I do that? Well, I need to create basically a mold of my mug. So I'm gonna turn my mug into a hole and I'm gonna grab just a normal box here and make sure that it's bigger than my mug, okay? So I have my mug inside of my box and I'll group those two shapes together all right. And if I make the box a hole, you can see that we essentially cut the mug into the box. So I kind of made a mold uh, for my mug. I can then take this gradient and put it in this shape and just make sure that it's bigger than my mug, like so. So we can see that the gradient is covering the mug size hole that I made. And if I select this together and group it, I now have a gradient colored mug. So super fun. So you can use these different shapes to manipulate your design, change your colors, uh, and, and just combine your shapes. And again, if this is something that you liked, you can add it to your creations and you know have a rainbow mug. So super fun as you're creating your custom designs. Another category and another tip and trick that's absolutely worth mentioning as we uh, kind of talk about our last couple of things here are the shape generators. So the shape generators are often made by either the Tinkercad team or other members of the, of the just Tinkercad community can contribute to these generators. And these are shapes that have really unique parameters, right? So for example, I know that my students like this curved text one a lot. So it automatically curves your text around a uh, diameter that you can set or an arc that you can set. So this is super fun uh, as you want to create perhaps 
curved text around a mug or a design, right? And we can see that there's a couple different ones here. So there's this art text that's kind of similar, but on a flat plane, right? Which is again, super fun that you can manipulate. Um, another really cool one is threads. So oftentimes my students ask, how could I make, you know, a threaded jar of some kind, right? So these threads can be used uh, to do just that, right? Where I can set my diameter, I can adjust my pitch or adjust my segments here and customize my threads as we go, right? So for example, what I might do is I might have a jar um, like so. And I'm just going to duplicate these threads so I have a spare. And I might cut the threads into this jar. And I'm definitely doing this very quickly. So take your time if you're trying to make threads that are nice and they work really, really well, right? But I can group these two things together, okay? And then what I could do is perhaps I don't want to change the size of my threads because then they won't match, but I can put, let's say, a lid on here, something like this, and have solid threads. Uh, and if you were going to 3D print this, we should have a conversation about tolerances and leaving yourself some wiggle room. But Nonetheless, it's a really great shape generator for you to incorporate threads. And there's just so many like that. So if you haven't checked out the generators, um, I recommend you browse through. I know there's a really cool QR code one, and there's some really cool scenes like brick walls or terrains uh, or silhouettes and stairs and things like that. So check it out. There's lots of great shape generators that you can drag into your design uh, to really enhance your design. Another really cool, and I just want to take a second to highlight is this awesome uh, snap together socket and tool, right? So let's say that I have parts that I wanna snap together. Maybe I put this pin on this part, and then I can switch this generator to be a hole of either tight fit or free spinning. So when I cut that shape into another shape, they're designed to perfectly snap together. So that plug would snap into this hole and it would allow me to have this snap together part. So again, there's so many awesome shape generators that I highly recommend you check out to enhance your design. Uh, and another one that's, I think one of my favorites because I come from graphic design and teaching graphic design is the ability to import SVG images. So if we click import, you can import 3D images, which I think a lot of you might know, but you can also import 2D images from your computer. So I'm going to import a SVG, which is a scalable vector graphic, and you can design these types of images in Tinkercad. Actually, you can download SVG images from Tinkercad, or you can use another uh, vector drawing program, uh, depending on what type of computer you're on, but you can import artwork and it converts that into being uh, a 3D shape. So that really allows you to, again, kind of enhance your design in a lot of different ways. And this was also recently updated. So we can see that I have my SVG shape, uh, and this is what the image looked like. It doesn't import color, so you'll have to set your color in Tinkercad. We can also see I can change my fill mode, right? So the default is however the shape was designed. But in Tinkercad, I could change this to be a silhouette, which means it's going to just fill the entire thing in. So you'll see that the hole is filled in. I could also change it to be a line, whether it's around the outside of my shape, or on the inside of my shape. And I can even adjust my corners if I wanted to round my corners a little bit more, or I can adjust my, my line width as I go. So you can customize your shapes that you import, uh, and you can really turn them into very aesthetically pleasing things if you kind of combine them with the things we've talked about. Like for example, the pattern tool, you can kind of duplicate your shapes and bring them around and make really interesting parts as you design and manipulate just by bringing in some different vector designs. And I love combining shapes, right? So I'm gonna bring that flower back in. We'll import this and you can see that I can set the size. So if this was drawn to scale, you can import it in scale or I can, I did this quickly before, but I can set the size that I want to import that shape on, which is super great. Um, and I can combine it, right? I have like the scribble tool here. So perhaps I draw a uh, stem for my flower, see if I can do that. Okay, something like that. So we'll set that to be green, right? And you know, just combine and make some really nice, unique designs. 
I'm actually going to just grab uh, one more vector shape, if you don't mind. So I'm going to grab a leaf vector like this. Let's see if I can set that to be a little bit smaller. Okay. And let's see. Here's my leaf. And we'll set this to be a little bit darker green. And again, vector images allow you to really enhance your design, right? So something kind of cool, right? So this was drawn in Tinkercad. And then these were two images that I was able to import into my design. Super fun. And just to also point this out, a lot of folks always ask me about different text or things like that, or, you know, clip art and things like that. So I'm going to switch to a design that I have from a cool project where we're making uh, a habitat here. And we can see that this little concession stand is really enhanced just by importing SVG images uh, to add to the design. Uh, so that way, as you're creating these real world kind of scapes here, I'm just going to make this, bring this in. Let me zoom out. You can see our zoo. We have obviously some really cool things that you can make in Tinkercad, but the zoo looks pretty realistic because we also have all of these signs. And they were really enhanced by the ability to bring our SVGs in. And I'm just going to use the cruise feature that we talked about earlier to snap this little refreshment text onto our refreshment stand and uh, finish out our Tinkercad Zoo. So super fun as we work here. And something kind of sort of like that. We'll leave that there for now. But you can see we have recycling cans and signs and things like that. So all of these images can be imported to enhance your Tinkercad designs all by importing vectors. So that's a super fun feature that my students really love to do. And as I mentioned, you can export vectors from Tinkercad as well. So if you select your shapes uh, under the export window, not only can you export in 3D, you can download things as SVG, which will flatten your shapes and download essentially whatever your bottom layer is. So that's a fun thing to play with if you haven't tried that, uh, working with SVGs. And the last tip and trick uh, is the collaborate feature, where if you want your students to share your designs with you, uh, or if you want uh, students working in a group, you can press the invite button right here, which is the person with the plus button, and students can generate a link that can then be shared, uh, not only to view the document, but you can actually have multiple people within a single document designing together. So when I'm challenging my students to be working in groups, they can both be, or three of them can be in the same document working together or working on different things and copying it from one Tinkercad tab to the other, like I showed you earlier. So that's an awesome tool for you to be able to allow your students to collaborate with you or allow them to collaborate with each other. So those were the tips and tricks that I planned on covering uh, tonight. And I want to just not only remind you that not only will you have the, the Tinkercad slideshow, uh, I want to point you to the Tinkercad dashboard. So if you're signed into Tinkercad, under resources, you can see that there's actually a tips and tricks section, uh, part of the Tinkercad blog. And we have a bunch of different articles here, not only uh, a lot of the things that we talked about, but of course, we only had so much time to talk about so many things. So there's so many different guides, and you can see a lot of the things I talked about right away, all in here as you're working. So I definitely recommend you check out our Tinkercad blog for tips and tricks, inspiration, projects, all these different things as you're working through. And again, everything that I chatted about is going to be shared into the slideshow. Even So even though I demonstrate all that live, when you receive the slideshow in our follow-up email, uh, you can kind of flip back in the slides. So you'll see that every single thing, again, had a slide that you can visit and uh, review all the things that we chatted about. So um, before we sign off, a couple great things that we want to talk about here. First off, for if you attended live, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, we're going to follow up with an email that includes a link to the slideshow, a link to Tinkercad blog and things like that, and also a one-hour PD cert certificate uh, for you attending this one-hour session with us. So thank you again for joining us live. And as I mentioned, this was recorded, so we'll make sure that that recording is shared with you uh, in the next day or so once it's published and available to share. And before we sign off, uh, and go into our Q&A. We do have a Q&A, so don't worry. Uh, I want to invite Randy here just to talk about a couple exciting contests and things that are happening in the Instructables community. All right, so I'll be quick because I know we're a little short on time. So we have the first time author contest. So if you're new to Instructables, you've never posted a project before and you want to check it out, uh, we have a special prize for people specifically using Tinkercad, so that's cool. We have the robotics contest which this one's great for uh, engineering and STEM classes. Again, has a Tinkercad prize, and it's definitely a contest worth checking out. Jewelry, um, another fun one. I know people in Tinkercad love to make jewelry. 
And so we made a contest and again, another Tinkercad prize and um, it should be a fun one to do it's just students to get creative, um, make some noise. Uh, this is sort of the classic, anything that makes sound contest. It could be an instrument. It could be perhaps a, like a phone speaker, anything that makes noise in some way. And again, we have prizes for Tinkercad. And I should also mention Fusion. A number of these you might have also noticed have prizes for Fusion 360. So you should, if you're teaching a more advanced class and you want to have them participate in these challenges, you should definitely check that out as well. And finally, this is uh, the project, not project, contest for teachers. It's a project-based learning contest. This is a little bit of a tongue twister there, uh, but there's 40,000 prizes for people who are sharing project-based learning projects that they're doing in their classroom. So I highly recommend checking that one out as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, I just want to remind you, our next webinar is going to be on November 2nd, and it's all about SimLab. So that's uh, kind of a feature within the 3D design editor where you can take your 3D designs like we talked about tonight, but apply real world physics and bring them to life. So that's going to be a really fun one in two weeks, same place, same time. Uh, and I'm going to minimize the slideshow here. And before uh, we just start the Q&A, in case you're going to sign off, I just want to, again, thank everyone for joining us in tonight's webinar. It was a lot of fun going over the tips and tricks. And you can now see the Tinkercad team that's been with me behind the scenes. So these are the folks that have been working really hard to answer your questions in the chat. So again, thank you for everyone who is with me tonight to help coordinate this. And also, there's a huge Tinkercad team that helped put this whole thing together uh, that's always working to make Tinkercad as awesome awesome as it is. So a huge thank you to all of you for attending, everyone who's with me. Uh, and again, we hope you enjoyed. So